I believe what he's saying here. I believe what he's saying. It continued here. Right. Where else do I hear? It's being recorded, so it continues. I just, there we go. I just believe that uh, my generation, I could be wrong, but I believe my generation, I was born 1946, Israel was born 1948, I believe that my generation will not pass away until all these things be fulfilled. Now, I'm not setting a time. We don't know how long a generation is. A generation could be 40 years. A generation could be 80 years. Abraham lived 120 years. Noah, okay, those generations were way beyond us. So how long is the generation? We don't really know, but this generation shall not pass away till all these things be fulfilled. I believe that, 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 that that's how I interpret that. And I could be wrong. Many of the Bible scholars interpret it to mean this race of people, the Jewish people, that they will not pass away until all these things be fulfilled. I personally think it's talking about the generation that witnesses the birth of Israel, the generation that witnesses this explosion of independence in all these nations, that nation will not pass away until all these things that I'm telling you, what Jesus is saying here, will come to pass. I better be quiet. John, I'm sorry. No, no, that's perfect. Uh, maybe a picture of how it affects the nations. It would be like if the Lord's correcting me on something, it's going to affect my family. It's going to affect my friends. It's going to affect my church. So even though God's correcting the Jews, it's going to affect the nations. But he, his purpose is to correct the Jews, is to work with the Jews during the tribulation. One you other thing we say. have to remember, hey, John, one other thing you have to remember is in, in Revelation, okay, four is the rapture. Revelation four verses one through three, that's the rapture. And then beginning in Revelation chapter five and six, okay, I think it's chapter six, is the sealing of the 144,000 Jewish evangelists. So that's, that's why we know it's, it's the tribulation is specifically God's dealing with the Jewish people because he seals these 144,000 Jews. Is that in chapter six? I believe chapter six, right? I got it. I got it right here. Let's see. In the time of rapture, Many Gentiles will be also left, right? They will be in the time of Antichrist, right? Yeah, a lot of Gentiles will be left in the time of rapture, right? Yeah. Yeah, they will go undergo in the tribulations, right? Revelation so my seven. question is, when the Gentiles will have a tribulations? Many people teach that. It's the first time the tribulations is only for the Jews. Second three and a half years, tribulations for the Gentiles. There I have a little doubt whether... The first three and a half years tribulations will be for the Gentiles or the Jews. That is my question. Because people teach that the first three and a half years tribulations for the Gentiles. The second three and a half years tribulations for the Jews. There I have little doubt. So I want to clarify that whether who will have a tribulations first, the first three and a half years. Everyone, everyone, everyone that's left behind, brother, everyone, everyone, Jews and Gentiles. It's going to be a terrible, terrible time. Terrible, terrible. But specifically, God is dealing with the Jews. But certainly, as John said, all the other nations are going to be affected. The Gentile nations, all will be affected. Mm -hmm. God told, God told, God told Paul, 
2,000 years ago, I will show him how great things he must suffer. Paul said we must enter into the kingdom of God with much tribulation. Okay, tribulation is, is part of life. Tribulation is part of, of, of reality for all Christians. Just because we get saved doesn't mean life's going to be a bed of roses. Uh, God uses tribulations, trials and tribulations, according to James and Peter, to, to grow us and to develop us. So I don't know, Pastor Joel, satisfied? Are you satisfied? And you got still uh, any follow-up question, maybe? How can we, do we have to dichotomize where it's just the Jews or Gentiles, Pastor Joel? Yeah. Yes. Uh, I think so. Yes. Uh, Dr. Starr said uh, tribulation is not difference for Jews and for Gentiles. It will be occurred at the same time yeah. after the church has taken, after the church has taken, and the tribulations will be introduced. That is for the disobedient Easter, as well, yeah. yes, for the unbelieving Gentile. Yeah. And this will go about seven years. Yes. Yeah. And uh, yes, uh, Pastor Choi is asking the questions about three and a half and three and a half, half, half. Uh, this kind of theory is, this is not the teaching of the dispensational premillennialism teaching, but this is the teaching of the historical premillennialism teaching. So we don't we don't believe of this. We believe only dispensational premillennialism teachings that seven years, full seven years, that disobedient Israel and unbelieving Gentiles will go to tribulations. The tribulation is the judgment of God over the disobedience Israel and the unbelieving Gentiles. It says it will try the whole earth, the right. whole earth, everyone. The whole right. earth for everyone who are not removed from the earth at the tribulation day. The church yes. from the whole earth, the church will be removed at the tribulation day, but the rest who are not removed, they are the disobedient and unbelieving. So they will join together there at the tribulations. Right. That's, so if, uh, that's uh, brother John. Excuse me. That's the, yeah. uh, what brother uh, Victor is pointing out here. Is we are dispensationalists. Baptists as Baptists, we're dispensationalists. A uh, covenant covenant theology would espouse this kind of teaching, where you split it up. Okay, that's covenant theology. And we, I don't support covenant theology. Uh, brother, uh, I think last week, uh, Brother um, John, I mean, Brother, uh, help me out here. David. Brother David, he, he brought out what covenant theology teaches. We don't, we don't subscribe to that. Uh, covenant theology actually came about as a result of the Reformation. Uh, Baptists have been around since the days of Jesus Christ and uh, Biblicists, people that are Bible believers that are Biblicists have been in existence in the days of Jesus Christ and John the Baptist, okay? And so we trace our heritage all the way back. We didn't come out of the Reformation. We didn't bring uh, a lot of the Roman Catholic dogma with us. We are Biblicists. And there's a big difference between covenant theology and dispensational theology. And next week, maybe 
if uh, if I if I feel up to it, I'd like to touch go back and review what I covered on dispensational theology. I'm sorry, John. Carry on. Well, that's very good, and uh, yes. So if we if we try to uh, dichotomize and put the Gentiles just in the first half, I had mentioned a few months ago. Then we'd have to put the rapture at the mid, at midpoint too. We don't want to go there, so we don't want to go. Very there. good point, John. A very good point, and that's why exactly I had mentioned a couple months ago. Some believe that way, <laughs> so that we don't want to go there. So he breaks the treaty with Israel, and when he breaks the treaty with Israel, here's how he does it: Daniel nine twenty seven. He shall confirm the covenant with them for a week, and in the midst of the week, we we're just talking about the middle. He shall cause the sacrifice of oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abomination, he shall make it desolate, even to the consummation. And that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. So the treaty would serve as an impetus for his rise. So the tool that was used for him to politically rise at a certain point midway through, it's no longer convenient for him. It's no longer politically correct for him. So he breaks it in a heinous manner most unthinkable manner. He will forcibly stop Israel from offering temple sacrifices and will order a huge image of himself to be made and moved into the Holy of Holies in the temple. And he will then demand worldwide worship of himself, 2 Thessalonians 2, 4 and Revelation 13, 14 and 15. Chapter 13, verse 14 and 15. So then after that, he's going to kill the two witnesses. So first he breaks the treaty with Israel to to bring his rule of terror across. Then he kills the two witnesses, Revelation chapter 11, verse three to seven. And I will give power unto my two witnesses and they shall prophesy 2,000, I mean, 1,200 and three score days, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceeded out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. These have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophesy and prophecy, and have power over water to turn into blood and smite the earth. You with have the reference of that of the olive tree and the candlesticks. You have a reference for that, John. Is that Zechariah? Revelation eleven, Revelation eleven, verse three through seven. Also, I think Zechariah. Okay. Yes. And, and when they have finished the testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit will make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. So what I'm saying is after the removal of the church, we're, we're in the tribulation and God will send the two witnesses to minister during the first three and a half years of the tribulation period. It's possible that it's Moses and Elijah that's, uh, uh, resurrected. We, we don't know who it is, but they're in that character. We'll proclaim the message of the coming kingdom of God and necessity of repentance and faith. Through their ministry, many will come to saving faith in Christ and clear counterfeit nature of man and Christ will be testified against. So because many will be saved, many will come to the knowledge of Christ, saving truth, the counterfeit of Antichrist is more relevant, is more prevalent, is more seen, it's more visible. So that's going to make the Antichrist very upset. Having gained the political and military leadership of the world, Antichrist will move against any and all competition to his aspiration of obtaining worldwide worship. He will break the treaty with Israel, stop their worship, and delight in delivering the world to troublemaking witnesses. So just like... Uh, in, in times past in history where the Nero blamed the Christians for what was done there, the uh, Antichrist is going to blame the Christians for what's being done there. The world will delight in the Antichrist destruction of the two witnesses. It says in Revelation chapter 11, verse 10 and 11. So we were earlier in verse 3 through 7. Now we go to verse 10 and see, and they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another. That, that, passage is familiar to us because of the uh, giving gifts one to another that we, we see how could they do that because these two prophets tormented them day 
that dwelt upon the earth. And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them. And they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon all of them that saw them. So here is another point of testimony of the type of leadership that the world delights in. The unsaved world delights in depraved leadership. Please note, however, the emphasis in the word of God when the witnesses are killed and when they have finished their testimony. So the, the, the witnesses have finished their testimony that God's plans and purposes are never thwarted. And those aligned with the enemies of the cross never win. The pleasures of sin are few and fleeting. The world delights over the death of the prophets is short-lived as the Lord resurrects his servants and fear fall upon all of them. So there are many in society today that think that believers are, are, are holding up the progress of society. But while being made the object of such persecution, is not an appealing thought. May we be reminded that our world is not in our in is not in control, but God is in control. As we faithfully engage our ministries and our life in our ministries, that God may be has called us to do, we will be here until we have finished our testimony for God. May we also be reminded of the inviolable Bible principle that whatever a man sows, that shall he reap. If you reach to the flesh, corruption. If you reach to the spirit, eternal life. So we're saying continue steadfastly in, in the word. We see of the tribulation. We, we see uh, of the destruction. But the Antichrist will not prevail. He destroys the harlot world church eventually. So as Revelation 17 comes into play, verse 15 to 18, and he saith unto me, the waters which thou sawest, where the whore sitteth, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore, and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For the God hath, for God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will, and to agree and give their kingdom unto the beast, until the words of God shall be fulfilled. And the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. So Babylon's going to fall. That one world church is going to fall because even though they say they love Jesus and they're gathering together in his name, supposedly, an ecumenical religious system will fall. The horror is the one world church that has been established following the rapture of the church and the following during the revelation of, of the Antichrist. Denominations are divisive, they would say. Doctrine is not important, they would say. It is unity in our love, they would say, for Jesus. But we know the opposite, that doctrine is That's important. John, be specific. We're talking about the Roman Catholic system. And other systems just like it, yes, sir, that are existing in the world today. But especially... That, that one because of its size. While claiming to be an, an instruments of God, the one world church will proclaim another Jesus, which the world will be ready to accept. So we don't have the uh, influence anymore of the church. So the world is now what it, what it was playing with, you might say, over centuries, over generations. Now they're willing to accept. What they toyed with, now they're willing to accept. God says that this church is a whore who is prostituting herself to do the devil's bidding. Having gained control over the world politics and economics and demonstrating superior, supreme military power, the Antichrist will no longer need the harlot church. The Antichrist henchmen, the 10 kings of the revived Roman Empire, will be glad to destroy the one world church and plunder her wealth. So what's going to result? The persecution is going to result of all who will not worship the Antichrist. Revelation 13, 8, and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundations of the world. And then going to verse 14, and the, the, and the deceived and, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by means of those miracles 
which it's the same word miracle that's used in the New Testament throughout. That's in Revelation chapter 13. It's still it's the same word that when Christ did miracles. They do miracles, which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth, that they should make an image to the beast, which was wounded by a sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as he would, as would not worship, the beast should be killed. So that's extreme persecution. But it's, it's persecuting the lost church and, it's all, and persecuting the saved ones you will see too in a moment because the world will be in awe of this man who had great abilities and the false prophets can even make images to speak. The signs and wonders which Satan empowers the Antichrist and the false prophet to perform will capture the world's attention and inspire their worship. Those who do not willingly yield allegiance to the beast will be brought by force to bow before him. All who refuse to worship the beast and receive his mark will be put to death. So it is at this point that God commissions 144,000 from the tribes of Israel, Revelation 7, 4, we looked at earlier and following, and Revelation 14, 1 and following, to be his messengers to proclaim the gospel throughout the world. Those who receive the gospel and are gloriously saved by grace through faith will be objects of great persecution. And many, if not most, will be martyred for their faith. So yes, there'll be people saved during the tribulation we said over the, over the months of study. But at this point, being the second half of the tribulation, most likely they'll be martyred very soon. Application today for us. What is the test of genuine faith? It's never made more clear when it's the ultimate to bow or die. Would you bow or would you stand firm in your faith by God's grace and die? The genuineness of our faith is revealed in the fires of persecution. As, as, as Brother Starr said earlier, there, there'll always be persecution. There, there'll always be tribulation. There'll always be test in our life. Satan's attacks in our culture are more and more subtle but we cannot be deceived that Satan has placed many temptations for professing Christians to bow at the altar and forsake their professed allegiance to God. Satan wants to worship today and wants worship today and tempts you with the treasures and pleasures of this world if you will bow before him. The affections of your heart truly manifest whom you worship. Are you bending or are you standing? James 4, 4. You adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship of this world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. And of course, we love the world, the people, those souls that are crying out, that we see in their eyes, their sorrow, we see their pain, and we see their lack of belief. But the world system is what we do not love, what we hate, because to love the world system is, is to hate God, according to First John chapter Two, verse 15 to 17. Any, any comments, Brother Starr? We can have a uh, time of questions and answers again. I think that would be good. Let's 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 them have some questions. Be good time for good time for that. Anyone questions about the first half or second half of the tribulation about how this antichrist can gain, gain rule, but he's always in God's hand that, that God's not going to let him go any further than he lets him go. This generation shall not pass away. till all these things be fulfilled. I personally believe that includes the tribulation period. That's part of what Jesus was talking about in Matthew 24, uh, the generation that sees the budding of the fig tree, the shooting forth of all these other nations, uh, independence. Um, I could be wrong. That's how I interpret it. Right, but if it's all these things, then it have to be. It have to be those that suffer those things. So. 
point is, it's close. The coming, the, the rapture is very, very close, very, very near. Yeah. Of course, it's all expected in his day, but how much, 2,000 years later, how much, how much, how close it must be. And with these strong birth pains right now, how much closer can it be? Yeah, especially what we're seeing on the on the world world scene, what we're what we're witnessing. <clears throat> you know, uh, 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 whoever would have dreamed what we've seen uh, through COVID and now this 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 evil man, what he's doing there in Ukraine. And I I, I read that he he doesn't plan to stop there. He doesn't plan to stop at Ukraine. He has, according to what I've read, he has plans to go beyond Ukraine into other nations. Yes. So he's going to persecute Israel with an intense cam campaign. We can go a little further and take another break in a once we finish this one section, it's just a few verses. He, in one, in one respect, he is, John. Zelensky is a Jew. The, the, the president of Ukraine is a Jew. So in, 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 in one sense, he is. I mean, the, the Jews are Already. a person. Yeah. But the, uh, the unbelieving will worship, it says in Revelation 13, 4, and they worship the dragon, which gave power unto the beast, and they worship the beast, saying, who is like unto the beast, and who is able to make war with him? So because of his victories, they're, they're going to believe that lie, and, and they're going to worship him. It's hard to believe, but we can't think in an unsaved mind in some, some, some respects, but, but we can imagine because of the, uh, the wickedness that we see today. Even when I step out of work yesterday, I know I'm facing the world in a, in a stronger sense than in a, in, a, in, a, in a square footage of a building. And so I know I have to be on my guard. So uh, gentlemen, be on your guard. As the days get closer, the temptations will get sore. Antichrist demonstrates his control over the world's religion. In verse eight of Revelation 13, we go down to verse eight. All, all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And then down to verse 15. And he, he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause many as would worship the beast, who would not worship the beast, that they should be killed. So it's either worship or die, like we said, at this point in the tribulation. So the Antichrist demonstrates his control over the world economies as well. It says Revelation 13. Just a couple verses later in verse 17, and that no man might buy or sell, save by the maid that had the mark and the name of the beast, the number of his name. Here is wisdom that him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, and that number is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred six three, four, and six, which is six, 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 we know. So there's gonna be no trade without this at this point. And so it's going to be worship or die. Worship or die. So, of course, believers will, will die of more martyrdom at this point. So that's, that's the end of section two. We had the, the rise of the, uh, him, just the initiation of his rise. Then we had the impotence of the, the uh, implementation of his rise as he, as he got powerful and powerful by defeating the three kings and then having control of the 10 kings, and then uh, having different miracles that people believed and putting up and stopping the uh, worship in the Jewish temple and putting up his image and getting and expecting worship and getting worship or, or killing those that would not. So it's no different than Daniel's day where he said, worship or die. And Daniel was willing to die if, if it took that. And went to the lion's den. So Revelation chapter 11, there were the two prophets, you know, they will come and they will prophesy. After that, they will die. They will be the slaves. So, do you have any idea about who are those two prophets? And people have some different ideas. Some people say 
One is maybe Eliza, another maybe Moses or Enoch like that. Do you have any uh, idea about who are those two prophets who will come in the time of tribulations? So their character will be like Moses or Elijah, but who they are, we don't know. Yeah, they have the character. Chapter 11. But it doesn't say who they are, just of their character. Some people say that prophet has a power to bring, you know, rain and, you know, fire. And also they say, yeah. maybe Elisa, you know, he may be Elisa. But... Right, that's why, because it says that, that's why we think it's that character, yes. So we don't know, but it, it's mentioning those things that happened in Elijah's day. Yes. So that, that's what leads us some to believe that. But we don't know for sure, but it, it could be Elijah and Moses based on what's mentioned. Uh, some people uh, yeah, preach that, you know, once we come into this world, we have to die. And Enoch and Elisa, they have not died. So maybe these two prophets have to come again and die and go to heaven. You see that? That is one kind of interpretations people teach. Enoch has not died. No, he just went to heaven directly. Elisa also went to heaven. That is why these two prophets, maybe Enoch also, because they have not died. So they have to come and die and go to the heavens. <laughs> Some people teach like that. Is any have any kind of interpretations? Yeah, we've heard that as well. Yeah, we've heard that as well. That so, it, so it's 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 logic. It's possible, but we don't know. Very good question. Very good question. Because these are the things that people ask us about in our churches. Any other questions of things that have been brought up in our churches that we know that we're going to have to face? Ask questions and, and we can point them to the scripture. It says in Revelation 11 what it says, but it doesn't say any more. So we have to leave with what it says. So, uh, Brother Victor, do you need a five-minute break or no? Are you guys, everybody's okay? Should we just go on? Brother Victor, you want a potty break? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, it's now 7-2, and this we can start at 7 10 or 7 12 for 10 minute break and 7 12 we can start again all right oh, 10 no. minute break we can have a break 10 minute break there we go so we're looking at the demise of the antichrist we we saw his initial rise then we saw his implementation of a great rise now we'll see his demise this is this is more enjoyable part in a, in one sense as we see god's sovereignty god controlling things always in every place that he only allows evil to go so far and no further in revelation chapter 16 verse 17 we see the destruction of the capital city babylon and the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying it is done and there were voices and thunders and lightnings and there was a great earthquake such as when not since men were upon the earth so mighty an earthquake and so great and the great city was divided into three parts the cities of the nations fell and great babylon came into remembrance before god to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. Verse 21 of Revelation 16.
and there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent. And men blasphemed God because of the plagues of the hail, for the plague thereof was exceeding great. And then we go to Revelation 18. We're, we're in Revelation 16, verse 17 to 21. Now Revelation 18, verses 19 to 21. And, the, and they cast dust on their heads and cried, weeping and wailing, saying, Alas, alas, that great city wherein were made rich all that had ships in the sea by reason of her costliness. For in one hour is she made desolate. Rejoice over her, thou heaven, and ye holy apostles and prophets, for God hath avenged you on her. And a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and cast it unto the sea, saying, Thus with violence shall the great city Babylon be thrown down and shall be found no more at all. So when Babylon's destroyed, it's quickly and it's completely. The seventh bowl judgment will take place near the end of the tribulation period and just prior to the return of Christ to establish his kingdom. Through the outpouring of the seventh bowl, Babylon, the capital of Antichrist's kingdom, will be made the object of God's judgment. God's destruction of the city will be complete, such as it shall be no more at all, it said, shall be no found no more at all. All the re unredeemed men of the world who love the things of the world will demonstrate their complete depravity and hatred of God as a blaspheme God because of the destruction of their city. So we have the destruction of his capital city and the demise of the Antichrist to destruction. He is going down. And we have the determination of his rebellion. So even though the destruction is coming and his capital city is destroyed, he is still determined. And he will be determined until he's in the lake of fire. He, he's still determined to fight against God. Rev, uh, Psalm 2, chapter 2. Psalm 2, verse 1 to 3. And the Psalm 2, verse 1 to 3. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. And then Revelation 19, 19. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. So having witnessed the destruction of his capital city, Antichrist will organize the remaining armies of the world in an all-out war against Israel that is ultimately aimed at overthrowing Christ. Such determination is incredible when you consider the magnitude of the judgment that God will have unleashed already at this point upon the world by this time in the tribulation period. Through the destruction of Babylon, God will have sent a clear message of his supremacy. Yet, the Antichrist is determined and he continues to rebel and, he and, it, and his rebellion will not be swayed for it flows forth from the extent of his deception which is complete. The deception of pride and the blindness of sin is never more fully seen than an antichrist. The deception of pride and the blindness of sin is never more fully seen than an antichrist. From a human perspective, the antichrist will be perhaps the most talented and powerful man alive, or man to ever live, you might say. He will have incredible skills and will obtain the position that many have died trying to reach, ones that we have seen in history. However, the absolute foolishness of his sin leads people to believe that they can overcome the power of God and thwart his plans. Antichrist will deceive the world one last time and lead the charge against the Lord's anointed. So an application of this truth, these truths about his rebellion and about his determination and his rebellion and about his destruction and his rebellion, we see, as John Bunyan says in Pilgrim's Progress, the path of the celestial city must be entered through the way of the cross. There are many who think they can gain heaven by their own efforts or through their own goodness. And the Antichrist believe 
that he could overthrow Christ and deceive the world in joining him in this vain plan. The deception of sin is powerful. While most people won't say that they are going to overthrow God, they simply define God in their terms and say he is going to have to accept them the way they are. That would be our nowadays application, that nowadays people will say that God has to accept me the way I am. And they're going their own way. They're not going the way of the cross. If you believe that you're going to make it to heaven because you are good or because of religious rites you have observed, then you are just as foolish as the Antichrist who will endeavor to wage war with the Lord. You must turn from your sin and rebellion and by faith in Christ receive him or else you will join Antichrist in the eternal lake of fire. There are no rebels who win in their war against God. So now we'll go from his destruction of his capital city and his determination to continue to fight against God to his defeat in, Arm in the battle of Armageddon and defeat of his armies in Armageddon. 2 Thessalonians 2, 8. And, when they shall, and, and then shall the wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. That's 2 Thessalonians 2, 8. And then Revelation 19, we've stopped at verse 19. Now let's go to verse 20. And the beast was taken and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him and which he deceived them that received the mark of the beast and them that worshiped his image and these both were cast alive into the lake of fire, which burneth with brimstone. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him, which sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. And then chapter 20, verse 10 of Revelation. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. So the battle of Armageddon will extend from the mountain of Megiddo, Megiddo Revelation 16, 16, to Jerusalem, Zechariah 14, verse 1 to 4, and to Basra and Edom, Isaiah chapter 24, verse 1 to 17, and Isaiah 63, verse 1 to 6. So from Megiddo to Jerusalem to Basra, that area, covering a span of 200 miles. It is more than a single battle. It is rather a multitude, multi-fronted war, an all-out onslaught by Antichrist in an attempt to destroy the remnant of God's people and engage Christ at his return. The arrogance of Antichrist and his might of his army will be met by invincible power of God and the incredible fur of his wrath against sin and unbelief. The Lord Jesus Christ will break through the clouds and descend upon the Mount of Olives, ripping a valley through the middle of it, ripping a valley through the middle of the Mount of Olives. And the people in Jerusalem will flee the onslaught of the Antichrist through the valley created by the Lord, Zechariah 14, and then verse 4 and 5. The Lord will empower the armies of Israel to overcome the armies of the Antichrist. Jerusalem will become a cup of trembling to the nations gathered against the Lord, Ze Zechariah 12, 2. The Antichrist will be deserted on the field of battle, 2 Thessalonians 2, 8 again, and all the armies slain, Revelation 19, 21 again. According to Isaiah 14, 4 to 21, the Antichrist, the king of Babylon, will be killed and his body left on the ground. The beast and the false prophet will become the first inhabitants of the lake of fire. Revelations 19, verse 20 to 21 again. And at the end of the thousand year reign of Christ, Satan will be cast into the lake of fire to join the antichrist and the false prophet. Revelation 20, verse 21. While men would like to believe that death is their end or that hell is simply a place of purging, hell and eternal punishment with no remedy and no relief will be their stay. That will be their, their fill. That will be their reward. Men that are without Christ, that are following Satan. So in conclusion, the Antichrist's brief career 
a world dominion and world worship will end in eternal destruction under the hand of God Almighty. So is the end of all who pursue pleasures and treasures of this world in rejection of the provision and promise of God. God will not be mocked. In fact, the utter destruction of Antichrist and his armies of unbelief will complete the vindication of God in human history. So all this time in human history, this wrath was waiting and waiting and waiting. God was not slacking his promise. As some men count slackness, was long suffering toward us word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So the Lord was waiting and was merciful and had tender mercies and had loving kindness. And now the wrath comes upon the, the world. God's plan and power is eternal, unchanging and most clearly not subject to the rebellion of men. Antichrist will amass under his dominion all of the treasures and pleasures of this world which men seem to content to live for. Whatever quest for power, prestige, and wealth that flames the passions of men, Antichrist will accomplish. So all, all along we're saying he's building up. He has a little star, then he builds up a great army, and then he has he, he's defeated by his capital being destroyed, but he continues to fight, he continues to fight to the end. And God will uh, unleash the second half of the tribulation upon him. He will be king over the year, over the earth for three and a half years, but far often professing believers accept the value system of this pagan world and live as if his power and prestige and wealth are really worth spending their life to gain. We began to think like the psalmist in Psalm 73, the envy of the prosperity of the wicked and wonder if we are kept our hearts pure in vain. The unregenerate world around us is content. We see living day to day, gentlemen, brethren, we see the unregenerate world is content to follow the path of Antichrist and live for the temporary pleasures of this and treasures of this world, deceiving themselves to believe that God does not judge and will not judge because he's slow to wrath, because he's long suffering toward us. Herein is the great battle of faith. Will you live for the pleasures of God or for the treasures of the world? When you grow discontent with the provision of God in your life, and will you envy the wicked? Antichrist will have all that the wicked have set their hearts to pursue before you follow his lead. Consider this end. The end of all who live for him, live like him. Eternal destruction in the lake of fire and under his wrath. And I'm talking about Psalm 73, verse 3 to 18. For I was envious uh, at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. This is Psalm 73 by Asaph. For there are no bands in their death. For there are no, their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men. Neither are they plagued like other men. Therefore pride compass them as a chain. Violence covers them as a garment. Their eyes stand out with fatness. They have more than the heart could wish. They are corrupt and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. They set their mouth against the heavens and their tongues walketh through the earth. Therefore his people return thither and waters of a full cup are wrung out to them. And they say, how doth God know? And is there any knowledge of the most high? Behold, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world, they increase in riches. Verily, I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocence. For all day long have I been plagued and chastened every morning. If I say I shall speak thus, behold, I shall offend against the generation of my children. When I thought to know this, it was too painful to me until, a big until there, until I went into the sanctuary of God then I understood their end. Surely thou dost set them in slippery places. Thou castest them down into destruction. And then verse 25, that was, that was, I, that was Psalm 73, verse 3 to 18. Let's go down to verse 25. Whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none upon earth that I desire besides thee. My flesh and my heart faileth, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For lo, they are far from the, thee, 
they that are far from thee shall perish. Thou hast destroyed all them that go a whoring from thee. But, just like we had until earlier in verse 17, now in verse 28 we have, but it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God that I may declare all thy works. So what is our career path today? Whom do we envy? Can we say with the psalmist that we do not envy the, the unbelievers and what they prosper in, but we follow God and we worship God and we serve God with gladness and we're trusting God and we're glad to declare his mighty works all of our days. Now that completes the lesson for today. Brother Starr wanted me to complete one lesson, number 112, and take it time through it. But any other questions that we have at this point about the lesson or about other things, about the uh, rapture, the tribulation, these kind of things. About specific passages in Revelation. We were mostly in the book of Revelation today. This page after page is the book of Revelation. As I look back, I see the book of Revelation on every page almost. So I guess the best homework is to read Revelation from 11 to 20. When shall these things be? What shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? That's my question. When shall these things be? What shall be the sign of thy coming? And of the end of the world. So the rapture is the, is the biggest sign that we have. But we have these signs that are present today, wars and rumors and wars, but the end is not yet. But they're getting stronger and stronger. And, effect, and, and, and with, because of media and communication, the whole world is watching each event that's happening in these last days. Watching together. Thank you, Brother John. But let's please pray for Brother Starr. We, we want next him to be hundred percent. Next week, I want to I want to review on the dispensations. Uh, so next week, we'll, I'd like to review with the uh, men. Yeah, that'd be very important. Any other questions today? Let's go to prayer then. And if if several gentlemen would like to pray today. Who would lead us in prayer this morning? We just take turns. Brother Rajan, why don't you lead in prayer? Okay, Pastor. Okay, let's pray. Father Lord, we want to thank you for the wonderful privilege that we have come into your presence, O oh Lord. We are very delighted for we are going through uh, your, uh, what is written on your word and how to uh, how to get to know more about you, Lord. Thank you, Father, for using uh, Brother John to speak to us so that uh, we could know 
your plans and purpose in our life and we could know that what are the things that uh, are going to happen in the near future and what is uh, this all of that opening up our eyes and thank you father for helping us to learn from today's class i bless each one of us those who are present here in your, in your presence, Lord, and those who are gathered together in your name. We thank you. We, we bless uh, Brother John, and we bless uh, uh, Brother James Starr. We bless Brother Victor and everybody, those who are uh, listening uh, and uh, participating in this class, Lord. Thank you for working in our lives, and thank you, Father, for enabling us and giving us wisdom, knowledge, and understanding to work for the expansion of your kingdom and for the glory of your name. We surrender everything into your mighty hand. Thank you for taking charge of the meeting from the beginning till the end. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Uh, I have a question. Brother John, Brother John yes. taught about uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Uh, he talked about how that... Um, there's uh some 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 someone who is hindering and until he be taken out of the way um the antichrist the wicked one cannot be revealed well, who is that who's that who is that that second thessalonians is referring to Uh, the church any any of the students okay okay the church okay all right the holy spirit in the church okay the church i believe that would be a correct answer the, another question based on that according to second thessalonians chapter two reading down through that chapter People who have heard the gospel, <clears throat> people who have heard the gospel, okay, after now, like in, 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 in this dispensation, okay, the church age, people who have heard the gospel and have been confronted with the gospel, is it possible after the rapture for for these people uh, to get saved? My question is, someone in this dispensation, the dispensation of the church age, that's the dispensation we're in right now, they hear the gospel okay and the rapture occurs is it possible for them to be saved after the rapture if they heard the gospel during the church church dispensation and i would like somebody to answer that question based on second thessalonians chapter two In particular, I think verses 10 through 12. Mm -hmm. Somebody want to read? Maybe read uh, verses 8 through the end of that chapter. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 8 through the end of the chapter. And then answer my question. Praise the Lord. And then, sir, we carried by regular whom the, whom the Lord Sir, consume with the spirit of his mouth, and sir, 
destroy with the brightness of his coming. Okay, but read on, read down through verse 12, down through verse 12. That they all might be the man, the man who believed not the truth, not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So what's the answer to my question? Is it possible for someone to hear the gospel in the dispensation of the church yes. and then the rapture occurs okay the, the the believers are taken out is it possible for that person then to get saved according to those verses yes, sir. Yeah. impossible sir What's so that? Ta talking about in the time of Antichrist, after the rapture, Antichrist will occur, right? That's, that's right. Yeah, in that, time, in that time, there is a possibility. Those who are left, you know, Bible says many martyrs will be there. Many, many will be killed as a martyrs and they will die on that day in the time of Antichrist because they will refuse to worship the Antichrist. Okay. What so, does 2 Thessalonians 2 say? What does 2 Thessalonians 2 say regarding people, people who did not receive the love of the truth when they could, okay? Otherwise, they heard the preaching of the gospel. They heard the preaching of the gospel. And then the, then the rapture occurred. The, the church was taken out. What does it say there that is going to happen to those people who heard the gospel prior to the rapture what 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 according to those verses what's going to happen to those people at verse 12 what is he just saying yes. god will send them a strong delusions that they will they should believe a liar exactly so people who have heard the gospel now, we're not talking about people that have not heard. We're talking about people that have heard the gospel in this dispensation. And they, and they re, 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 refuse the gospel. They reject the gospel. Based on those verses, it would appear that God's going to send them strong delusion. And so that they're going to believe whatever the lie is, whatever the lie of Antichrist, whatever the lie is. They're going to believe that lie and they're going to be damned. If I understand those verses correctly, people in this dispensation that reject the gospel <clears throat> will not and cannot get saved during the tribulation. As our other brother said, yes, many people will be saved. But I believe the people that are going to get saved during the tribulation are people who have never heard. So in the Jews, those who are left in the time of rapture, will there be any opportunity in the time of Antichrist they will believe Jesus Christ? The Jews who are left in the time of rapture, Will there be a time for them in the time of Antichrist they will believe Jesus and they can go to heaven? I believe. I believe that there are people that many Jews that have not heard the a clear presentation of the gospel that they will be the ones that will get saved during the uh, tribulation. Absolutely. But it would appear that anyone that has heard the gospel, a clear presentation of the gospel, this side of the rapture, and they reject that after the rapture occurs, they will be, God's going to give them some kind of strong delusion, and they're going to be damned. 
because they had they did not have pleasure. They had pleasure in their sin. They wanted their sin more than they wanted the Savior, and they chose to live in their sin. And the result is, is that they're going to be damned. But yet, there are many people that are going to be saved. <clears throat> but I believe the people that will be saved during the tribulation are people that have never heard the gospel who never heard a clear presentation of the gospel. Brother John. John, are you still with us? Brother John. Uh, Brother John, your mic's not on. Brother John, your mic's not on. Yeah. I couldn't be quiet. Unmute, unmute, uh, John, sir, your microphone. Is it working now? Yeah. Yeah, now you are. All right. I don't know how it got un unmuted, but yes, uh, Doctor Starr. Yeah, Brother John. Just uh, any 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 comments as far well, as says, what are your thoughts on that? In Second Thessalonians chapter two, verse ten to twelve, it says, "And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness, and them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth." that they might be saved. So they heard the gospel. They received it not. They could have been saved if they received it, but they didn't. And for this cause, God shall, at that point then, at this point, God shall send them a strong delusion that they should believe a lie. So once they believe a lie, they can't believe the truth. That they might be damned who believe not the truth. That's what it says in the next verse. So, that's why it's just a colon there. But had pleasure in unrighteousness. So this is someone that's not believing and have heard the word and not believing. They put themselves in a position now that God at, at this point is going to have people be in a position where they'll believe the lie. So Antichrist comes on, like we said, he's going to want worship of himself. He's going to be very deceitful, more deceitful than anyone that ever came before. And they're going to believe the lie. There's going to be a strong delusion. There'll be no longer the work of the church through the Holy Spirit of God in, in the lives of men. That common grace is not going to be present. So without common grace, all, all, all the things that they would do and, and thought they could do, they'll, will be, they'll be willing to do without God's restraining power. So God will let them go so far and no further, of course, in his timing. But yet, imagine if we didn't have the grace of God. And we would not believe them on this or that. That's hard enough. But they're not they're not saved and they don't believe the, the word of God. And now they give strong delusion to believe the lie. They can't turn back. So what's what's the uh, ammunition for us? It says stand firm. We ought to thank God. That's the rest of the chapter. Stand firm and hold to the teachings. May the Lord Jesus Christ and God our Father who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and work. So be glad that we're believing him by his grace. So that's a hard saying, but it's true. Amen.
Brother Thapa, are you still there? Yes, yes, I'm here. <laughs> okay. Is class is over? I think I think it's uh, we're finished and. Um, okay. So just uh, I'm just uh, thank you to Johnson and Dr. Star and just I I'm joining half and half not joining in the class because uh, I am some with Dr. Mike here <laughs> uh, and so by the way uh, thank you uh, next week. <laughs> 